So, uh, following our links down at the bottom here to, um, so, okay, to the uh, commentary. So, um, we talked a little bit about the organization about the source tree. So, um, now we're going to sort of zoom into the compiler itself. Um, beginning with the compilation pipeline. So the compilation pipeline is the sort of entire life cycle of compiling a, a Haskell program um, from beginning to end. Um, and uh, so you, you'll, you'll be aware that the, the core part of GHC is, of course, taking Haskell source code and compiling it to um, C or assembly code. But of course, to, to, for the end-to-end -end thing, we need to invoke various other programs, uh, like a, a deliterating de processor at one end and a C compiler or an assembler at the other, other end. And all of that is done by, um, by, by GHC, the Haskell program GHC. So GHC invokes these other programs, then as it were, invokes a large chunk of itself, and then invokes some other programs at the end. So this is meant to just sketch um, the, uh, the pipeline of things that happens. Uh, the first thing we do is we run, do we run CPP or the literate preprocessor first? Literate first. Hmm? first, right, so the second bullet comes first. Oh, have you got the, uh, the computer that we're taking notes on? Yeah. Right. So the first thing is we move, we move um, literate markup. So this is bird tracks, these kind of uh, angled back things you've seen in uh, Haskell source files um, when, you, when the code looks like um, looks like this with an angle back in front, or begin code, end code stuff. And so there's a separate program which lives in um, that utils directory that Simon described earlier. So the utils directory contains this unlit program, so we run that. Refresh, Simon. Refresh what? The page. The page. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, splendid. Ah, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> By magic, the unlit preprocessor has moved to be the first thing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, very much. Now, these, these processes actually generate fresh files. Um, and uh, at the time I wrote this, I didn't know what the. the, uh, the, the, the we, we started with a Haskell source file that might be foo.hs or foo.lhs, the L standing for literate source. And we generate um, uh, foo. <coughs> he looks at Simon. LPP, LPP perhaps, oh, right. So, uh, <clears throat> an, inter uh, an intermediate file here, um, using this process. So then we run good old CPP. It's quite embarrassing that we're still running CPP, um, but it's kind of uh, <coughs> so dash CPP dash F. So. Oh. And can somebody remove the dash F, please? Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's good. It's good. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So at that stage, we've got rid of all the markup, right? We've got rid of, we got rid of all the CPP nonsense, we've got rid of the literate stuff, so now we actually just have, honest to goodness, Haskell source code. Um, so now we can run the Haskell program, right? I think it generates food on HSPP. HSPP, yes, not LPP. HSPP. That means pre processed. Pre processed Haskell. Pre processed Haskell, right? Good. You want to look at this? I remember I typed it down. I didn't it. <laughs> right. So then we run the compiler itself. So the compiler itself runs um, uh, not as a separate process. It's just, it's just a big chunk of what GHC is. Um, and it generates uh, two things. First thing, it generates an interface file. Um, and, then it, and it also generates some kind of compiled code. Uh, unless we're doing, um, unless it's GHCI, in which case we might just be generating bytecode. So if you're going to generate compiled code, it will either generate assembly code, some foo.s file, or um, C code, which is foo.hc. So the HC stands for the, this is Haskellized C code, but it's compiled in a very special way using very special flags for GHC, and this is, sorry, for GCC, um, using non-standard bits of GCC and so forth. So the HC reminds you that not any old C compiler is going to do this, and you better know what you're doing when you're compiling. Um, this particular C file. Okay? Is that C minus, 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 or is it not C minus? No, yes. actually not. So I've jumped over that. When we get to the internals, I'll get to the C minus, minus bit. And at the moment, I don't. Yeah, no, actually, I, I lie. There's a third. You can output C minus, minus as well here. Um, in which case, it doesn't work. No. Used to. No, it never works. Yes, it did. <laughs> 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 That's my key. Oh, 
of these things you've never find Well, so, uh, so add, add a bullet here for C minus minus black. It's not sure if this works. <laughs> but generate C minus minus, and that would be a foo dot um, CMM. That's right. Project for tomorrow is to make the dash F CMM flag work. Yeah. Good. Add it to the projects. There's a, there's a list of projects attached to the hackathon page, and that would be another good thing for people to add to in your, as, you're, as you're sitting and wondering what shall I do in these couple of minutes. Go and add some projects and make CMM work again would be a good plan. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, if I press refresh, will some of these edits appear? Oh, I don't know actually sat listening. Oh, oh yes. I'll probably release it. Great. Okay, so in the case of the uh, uh, the C compiler version, this foo.hc, what do we compile? We compile to an assembly file, foo.s uh, uh, foo file, and then we've got to run the assembler uh, to do that. Only, alas, we can't just run the assembler because this foo.hc stuff is, um, uh, we, we, um, is essentially, we're just using the C compiler to compile basic blocks. So every... Uh, think everything that looks like a C procedure here is really we're really thinking of as just a label uh, with an entry point in it before it gets to the end of the procedure it jumps off to somewhere else. So the C compiler will produce prologues and epilogues for each C procedure, which just jump. We're not interested in them. So we post process the assembly file produced by the C compiler with this program called the Evil Mangler. Um, and the uh, and there's a second um, second step that happens after the evil mangler, or is it before the evil mangler, which is the splitter? After after the evil mangler, um, we do this splitting game to split the assembly file from one big assembly file into lots of tiny little assembly files, so that when you assemble all of them and then do linking, you're you won't have to get all of the unused code. It's kind of like a dead code you're using the link as a dead code eliminator. We're deeply not proud of the evil mangler and the splitter. Right? So anybody who could figure out a better way to do this back-end stuff, we'll love you forever. The whole C minus minus route is meant to be meant to be addressing that too. Did you use the evil mangler and splitter if you go straight to assembly code? No, straight to assembly code. Is there any splitting on straight to assembly code? Yes, the splitter can still run. Yes, yes, but not the mangler. Right. Because the, assembly, the, the, the code generator for assembly code doesn't generate prologues and epilogues in order for the evil man to remove it. It just generates the right thing. Yeah. Why, did you, why did you generate the procedures in the C code in the first place? Why do we generate procedures in C code? Because that's all C, that C programs consist of procedures. Well, but you don't need I mean, the one procedure with labels. Oh, you can have one procedure with labels. That breaks the, the, There's a whole story that goes with that, yes. <laughs> about, there's, in fact, there's a little cottage industry of ways to persuade C compilers to be, behave as your code generator. And the conclusion of the, uh, the story is, it was never designed for that, and you can persuade it to do it, but it's pretty difficult. Yeah. And we, we've chosen one way, there are other ways, but the right thing to do is to get Norman to build you a C minus minus compiler. Oh, where in the source code is the bit that guides all of this stuff? Yeah, the main um, it's the bit called, uh, this is um, uh, driver, pipeline. driver pipeline. Main slash driver pipeline. Good, good thing. This would be, uh, could somebody? Compiler slash main slash. Yes, compiler slash main. All of the compiler files are in compiler slash something. So it would be good to add a link. Yes, could, in fact, I don't know, since you asked the question, you could, you could add a link here to uh, say, this is this is all steered by compiler main driver pipeline. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to say a little bit about interface files because the interface files play a very pervasive role in GNC, so it's very helpful to have some clear model of what interface files are doing. Interface files are there to support separate compilation. So when we compile a Haskell file, we're going to generate a .o file, but also when we compile a Haskell file, we now know the types of all the functions in it, and we know uh, the strictness of the functions in the module, and we know what their arity is, we know, and in fact we know what their definition is, their unfolding 
that's what you call it, right? So there's a lot of information that you get from compiling a module that's, that we have in hand at that moment. And you could imaginably reconstruct it by looking at the source code. But in fact, it's very tightly coupled to the object code. If you compile with optimization, a function might have t 2. If you compile without optimization, it might only have t 1. I'm going to have a bit more to say about arities and stuff like that when we get to the inside of the compiler. But the, the message I want to give you is that when you compile a module, you get the object code and a whole lot of stuff that's very closely connected with the object code. So you should almost, I think of it, the interface file as part of the .o file. They travel together. They re, the, H, the interface file really ought to be inside the .o file. And if you know enough about ELF binaries and Microsoft binaries, you could probably do that. But because GHC is trying to be somewhat platform independent, we just generate a completely separate file. M3, M.O is the object file, M.hi is the interface file, but you should think of them as indissolubly linked. Like if you generate a fresh.o file, you'd really better generate a fresh.hi file, because if you don't, you might get safe faults. Because when GHC compiles a module K that imports your module M, during compiling K, it may consult the M.hi file to learn stuff about module M that it's going to believe. And if that contradicts what's in the .o file, you are deeply up, up the creek. Okay, so. Is there yeah. any kind of uh, uh, your visual signature to make sure those are consistent? And this is something we did with the C minus uh, minus There is no, 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 there isn't. And there and should be really, really, you could do this at the link step. That would be the time to make sure they're consistent with the. There are versions on yeah. the HI. And the HI file says which version of the other HI file it uses. Um, so I think if you get the wrong one, it's probably. Well, there's nothing to check that the, the .o files correspond. Oh, yeah. Right. So when, what you'd like to do is you, you'd like to, when, you, when linking, you should really look at the .o files, get a little, the little um, version number, which we do maintain, and say this .o file corresponds to the version number 7 of that HI file. Right. So the HI files, as someone was saying, are versioned. Every time you compile, if you change the HI file, the version number installed inside the HI file, the interface file, will change. Right? So it's just bumped up version by version. It's not a signature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is the interface file backward and forward compatible between compiler versions? The interface file is utterly incompatible between <laughs> compiler versions. <laughs> Completely incompatible. Um, so one of the things that we guarantee not to do on a stable branch is to change interface file formats. One thing that happens on the head quite frequently is a change of interface file format. Because the interface file is more or less simply a binary serialization of the current version of the iFace SIM type, which I'm going to show you more about in a little while. Right? And so we make no attempt to maintain compatibility there. It would be, I mean, of course, that would be wonderful in some ways, but it would tie our arms and legs in other ways. So we just say, we just own up and say, no. Yeah. Does the interface file? Let me give you a note of that. Does the interface file has any kind of dependency on GCC? No, the interface file has no dependency on the back end at all. The interface file comes out. I'm going to show you a, a picture of the uh, back. Why don't I just back up and show you? Ah. Oh. Right, so I backed up to the GHC commentary and I'm now going inside compiler. And this is going to, in fact, I'm going to jump up. Where did the, uh, actually, so the picture of the inside of the compiler that was after this in, in here. Okay. So this is the picture I'd like to look at. So you can look at this picture in a little bit more detail, but the, the, this is the, what happens when you're compiling one module. And you can see that the um, generating the interface file happens after optimization and so forth, but before code generation. Right? So the interface file comes off here. I'll describe this pipe in a bit more, a bit more detail. So it, the interface file is utterly independent of the back end that you choose. The, uh, whether you're doing assembly, by assembly code or by assembly. Yeah, good question. Okay. So, um, so I think that's probably all I'm going to say about um, 
that the compilation pipeline and the file is involved. Um, so you know, we can go to more detail about any one of them, but I just want you to have sort of overall picture of what the what the, the files involved are, particularly interface files. Oh, one more thing about interface files is interface files are stored in a binary format that, as we were saying, changes from version to version of GNC, but you can get an ASCII version of what's in an interface file by saying GHC dash dash show hyphen iface. This, is, this was on the page we were looking at a moment ago. And that gives you a, a, a human readable dump of what's in an interface file, which is awfully useful. Uh, one other thing to say about interface files is that when you're compiling with optimization, rather a lot of information gets into an interface file. When you're compiling without optimization, interface files are just type signatures, more or less. They're much smaller. So there's much less cross-module inlining goes on, but that's what you didn't ask for optimization, but the interface files are smaller. So you'll see a big difference if you do a show iface, having to compile the module with dash L and without dash L. There's a question over there. Oh, I was just wondering, does the textual presentation tend to, to uh, change between versions? The text, yeah, the textual representation is really meant for people. It's not so, really meant for, for stably feeding into other um, processes. So, uh, so what's our story about that? So I suppose we've moved towards thinking that if you want to consume interface files, probably the easiest thing for you to do is to do the is to import GHC as a library and then gain that access to Haskell data structures that will always be up to date and will always be able to read interface files. Reading interface files by show iface and then trying to parse that text would be fragile at best. And certainly when we did the pretty printer, we didn't think, oh, let's make this easy to parse. Yeah, uh, in what part of the compiler should one scrutinize and learn the contents and format of the .hi file? To, uh, to, to look in, to, to, to understand the abstract data type, the, so the algebraic data type that describes an .hi file, you should look in compiler, iface, iface sin. Right? There's a module called iface sin, and another module closely connected with it called iface type. So those two modules give all the data types for, um, uh, for interface files. And interface files are simply a binary serialization of that type. Right, so that's, that's one way to think of it. The binary, the binary, the exact bit format is not interesting. Okay, that might be another thing we want to add. So that's just the that's great.